structure, what, why, and how of curriculum design. I'll, it will be followed by examples of the what, and then to the why and how, and then unpacking higher order cognitive abilities, some more examples, so then I sum up. Now, what I've given here in the structure of the talk at this point will be are simply words to give you some kind of pegs, uh, but hopefully uh, the, uh, the meaning of the words will become clear as we proceed. Okay. Um, in part one, I'm assuming that when uh, I move somebody there would change the screen. In part one, I'm going to talk about the introduction to what, why, and how to curriculum design. So the first part, uh, I hope you can read the first part. It's extremely small. This wasn't what no, it was meant no. to be. I was supposed to do the PowerPoint slides. I find it very hard to read, but I'll, I'll go by that. I'll, I think I'll have the uh, PowerPoint slides here yeah. on my screen. Um, OK, the what is, what do we expect learners to have learned by the end of the program? That is, what information, understanding, skills, abilities, dispositions, habits of mind should we specify in the program final syllabus? Now, the word program final syllabus is important because usually when people say syllabus, they mean syllabus for the year or syllabus for a semester or syllabus for a course. What I mean is at the end of the entire program, so by the end of the first 10 years or by the end of an undergraduate program. Uh, that's the very first statement. And then the why would be, why do you want them to learn what we specify in that program final syllabus? This is part of the philosophy, education philosophy. Now, to give you an example, we specify in the school curriculum, let's say eighth grade or so, that students will learn what is called the uh, sum of angles, angles sum theorem, which says that the sum of angles in a triangle is 180 degrees. Nobody asks why they should learn that. I'm pretty sure that the people who are listening to me would have learned this. And if you ask yourself why you learned that, of what uses it for you now, have you ever used it? Have you ever thought about it? I'm pretty sure you would say, no, it was necessary only for the examination. So this question is hardly ever asked by the curriculum designers. And I would like to uh, emphasize this aspect of curriculum design. We just put in things in the curriculum because it is there in the curriculum earlier and so on. It's just historical accident. The how part, how do we help learners to acquire what is specified in the PFF, the program final syllabus, is about the pedagogy of the curriculum, uh, which means sequencing of items is part of the pedagogy, learning materials is part of pedagogy, classroom activities, part of the pedagogy, even assessment, assignments and assessment are all part of the pedagogy. In this uh, conference, it looks like we are focusing on the classroom pedagogy of the teacher, but the teacher should also ask, what is it that I want students to learn and why do I want them to learn? So if you're teaching geometry, you have to ask the question, why? Why do you expect uh, students to learn? If the only answer is, oh, because somebody has prescribed it and they'll be tested uh, on that, then what you're doing is really exam-oriented curriculum, not learning, valuable learning-oriented curriculum. OK, so that, that sets the trend for this talk. So to go to the first part, what? What do we want students to learn? Let me take you through a couple of examples of a different kind, the kinds of things that I would like to, you to pay attention to. So here is uh, an example. This is, I think, part of, again, eighth grade school curriculum. Uh, the NCRT, I'm not sure, some textbook. Uh, one of the teachers came to me with a textbook that said the following things. Number one. Microorganisms are organisms that are invisible to the naked eye. Next page said, fungi are microorganisms. And then it also said, mushrooms are fungi. Now, if you put the three things together, notice the logical consequence is, the conclusion from the first three statements is that mushrooms are invisible to the naked eye. The student who asked this question, and the teacher came to me, said, how can... How can that be? Because I can see mushrooms. And the student thought that uh, 
uh, he didn't understand something and the teacher also thought that she didn't understand something. That's why they came to me. Uh, so the problem here is that we can see mushrooms. So either what the textbook says is wrong or there is, uh, you know, you have to deny your own experience. So there is a logical contradiction. What should we reject? Okay. Uh, here is a problem to that solution. What the textbook said was definitely wrong. Uh, this, the textbook was unclear in stating that fungi can be either unicellular or multicellular. And unicellular fungi are definitely not visible to the naked eye. But there is also their microorganisms. But multicellular aggregates of fungi are not uh, visible to the naked eye. These are not unicellular. They are visible to the naked eye. So mushrooms can be either unicellular or multicellular. And that solves the problem because what the textbook should have said was unicellular fungi are microorganisms. That way the logical contradiction is avoided. This is what the textbook should have said, but that's not what the textbook actually said. Uh, okay, so what did we learn from this example of uh, logical contradiction in a textbook? Lesson number one, logic is a very powerful tool in critical thinking and critical reading. Lesson number two, there are two powerful concepts in logic or reasoning. One of them, which I used here in this uh, invisibility of mushrooms example, is that of logical contradiction. And the principle is a combination of something is true and the same thing is false is a logical contradiction that must be uh, rejected. The other is the principle of logical consequence, a conclusion derived from a set of premises. So we illustrated that with the mushrooms. I gave three different statements. And the conclusion was that mushrooms are invisible to the naked eye. And that creates a problem. So we fix the statement in the textbook. Lesson three, logical contradictions are a problem to be resolved. And we, we showed how that can be resolved. Lesson four, to resolve that problem, we have to reject or modify at least one of the contradictory statements. Finally, statements in textbooks can be occasionally wrong. We need a critical eye when reading textbooks, including, uh, there's a typo here, including INCLU, yeah, including what a textbook says. So we cannot simply swallow everything that a textbook says. We cannot swallow everything that anybody says. We have to evaluate everything critically because what we get can be full of falsehood, or at least minorly, minor falsehood. This is what we learned from the First example. OK, now take the second example. This has to do with ancient and modern wisdom. You're familiar with the statement that ancient sages tell us water and air are elements. And gold is not an element. There are only five elements, water, air, fire, earth, and so on. But our textbooks tell us that gold is an element, water is a compound, and air is a mixture. So there's a contradiction between what the ancient wisdom says and what the modern wisdom says. The ancient wisdom says that water and air are elements. And the modern wisdom says water and air are not elements. That's a clear contradiction. All right. What do we accept? We cannot accept both, but that because that will be a logical contradiction. All right. I'm sure that you're somewhat uncomfortable now. So let's uh, try to see how this can be solved. Here is a clue. Uh, the, what the ancients, at least in India, said was that there are five bhutas, pancha bhuta. So air and water and earth are one of the, uh, these, these are bhutas. But does the word bhuta translate as element in modern chemistry? If it does, then there is a logical contradiction. But if that is not what the ancients meant, then there is no logical contradiction, except that we should now understand what the word bhuta means, what, what do they mean by saying pancha bhutas? That is for us to decide now. We don't know. Okay, So I'm going to leave it at that. What I'm trying to suggest is that if you look at these aspects of logical consequence and logical contradiction, it will lead us to better learning. It, le it will lead us to think more carefully and look for learning. Now you have a, you have a commitment 
to learning what the word Bhuta meant. All right. So that gives you a sense of a uh, different set of learning outcomes, the kinds of learning outcomes that are not normally uh, paid attention to in traditional mainstream schooling. Okay, now that you have had a sense of the kinds of learning outcomes that are not present in current syllabuses, the kinds of things that I mentioned, let's ask why and how. Okay. Uh, why should we pay attention to the kinds of things that I mentioned? The, the two examples, fungi example and the uh, elements, Panchabhuta example. Uh, well, I'm not going to give my own justification, but I will ask you to read uh, the following uh, about the NEP 2030. I've given you the uh, reference. You can go to the web and find out. Okay. And if, if we accept NEP 2020, then we also have to accept that the kinds of learning outcomes that I pointed out are important learning outcomes, which of course means that some of the learning outcomes specified in our current syllabus should be rejected. The how part, uh, how is the pedagogy? And as I said, pedagogy includes sequencing of the program final syllabus, textbooks, uh, assessment, classroom activities, and so on. All of these come under pedagogy. But the kind of pedagogy that we use depends upon what we are aiming at. This is extremely important. So we cannot talk about pedagogy without the intention, without the aims of education. Uh, pedagogy by itself is, has no merit. Okay? So we usually use words like experiential learning, task-based learning, inquiry-based learning, problem-based. There are so many of them. If you just do a web search, there are dozens of them. And so I'm not going to go through this. I expect if you, if you are curious about any of these words, I, you could uh, Google them. Uh, you can uh, uh, ask me in an email. You cannot ask me at the end of this. Uh, you have my email address. You can ask me. I'll respond. OK. So let me go to the, 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 what, the, some of the unpacking of the what. And why? Uh, another reason for why it is important to pay attention to some of the things that I mentioned is that what I call the rational temper as a generalization of the scientific temper to include mathematical inquiry, scientific inquiry, and philosophical inquiry. These, these might be just words for you, but hopefully you will get a brief sense of what these things mean towards the end, not a full sense, because you can't get that in a 40 minute talk. And rational temper uh, is a gen uh, generalization of the scientific temper. And Article 51A of the Indian Constitution requires that uh, all citizens of India have the scientific temper. So the, my answer to the question why is that the Indian Constitution wants all the citizens to have the scientific temper. Rational temper is a generalized version of the scientific temper, not simply the scientific temper, but also the mathematical temper and the philosophical temper. So if you accept the constitution, then we have a responsibility to uh, implement that in our own curricula, in our own teaching. That's the answer to the question why. The first answer was uh, because NEP 2020 says so. And if you accept that statement, then obviously some of the things that I'm talking about would follow. I'm not saying that everything that others say should be accepted, but I'm hoping that you also accept it like me, not because it comes from some authority, but you have considered this and you accept it. All right. Now, what does it mean to say a rational temper? This, this is hardly ever explicated in the education literature. So let me give you a brief glimpse. I have already talked about two of them acceptance of uh, logical consequences. What that means is if you accept a set of premises, you should also accept the, the conclusions that follow from those premises. And we saw that in uh, the, the example that we mentioned, especially the fungi example. Prohibition of logical contradictions. You should not accept combinations of propositions which are logically contradictory. Again, this was the main theme of the fungus uh, fungi example. This is one of the uh, 
one of the uh, ingredients of rational temper. Uh, next, guardedness in accepting conclusions unless supported by adequate reasons. So if somebody tells you such and such is true, you should ask, why should I accept that? Give me the reasons. If somebody says, for example, the sum of uh, angles in a triangle is 180 degrees, ask why. And of course, in mathematics, you get the proof. But the same thing is applicable to science and uh, uh, other subjects, humanities and so on. Every, everything that we learn, anytime somebody asserts something, ask why. And do not accept conclusions without understanding the reasons for accepting the conclusions. Okay, but at the same time, <clears throat> at the same time, we should be open minded to accept conclusions if they are supported by good reasons. <clears throat> and if this, those reasons are good and the conclusions contradict what we uh, earlier believed, then we have to change those beliefs. So self correction is a very important aspect of the rational temper. <clears throat> okay, uh, the fourth one. Uh, if, the, if this goes, this is connected to self-correction, we must have a sense of the uncertainty and fallibility of one's own and other people's beliefs. This applies, for example, easily to science. So there, were, there are certain things that we learn in Newton's theory of uh, uh, motion and gravity. <clears throat> now, Einstein showed that some of the assumptions that Newton made were wrong. If Newton can be wrong, then most of the science that we learn could in principle be wrong. I'm not suggesting that everything that we learn is wrong. I'm saying we should be sensitive to that possibility. That's what I mean by sense of uncertainty. Scientific knowledge is not totally certain. And even mathematics, uh, because I, I will not go into the reasons for why that is so, even mathematics is uncertain. And if science and mathematics which are supposed to be the so-called so exact knowledges and so on. If these are uncertain, so are the other forms of knowledge. So we must have that sense that what we learn as knowledge is uncertain and fallible. Fa fallible means likely to be wrong. And that also means that we, our own beliefs could be wrong. This is not going to be easy because in order to be convinced of something, at the same time with the sense that what we are convinced by could turn out to be wrong is not an easy state of mind. My experience has been that it takes several years to get to that state of mind. But that is a state of mind that we want our students to have. We should strive for that. Uh, the fifth ingredient is the willingness to doubt and question the positions taken for granted. Our own positions and those of our peers, as well as those that we regard as authorities. So we must question experts, we must question our parents, we must question our leaders, we must question ourselves, of course. If, if we do not question the authorities, then the entire enterprise of education uh, would be, I wouldn't say complete failure, but there would be a serious flaw in our education. So these are the broad aspects of uh, the scientific temper. And what that means is if not just the scientific temper, but also the rational temper. And if we accept that as one of the aims of education, then we have to seriously overhaul our, uh, our syllabuses, our uh, textbooks, our classroom practices and all that. This is not going to be easy. But that's what um, I would like to point you to. Okay, I mentioned higher order cognitive abilities that uh, NAP 2020 mentions. A brief word about that too, in terms of what we aim at. Okay, so here is a quote from NAP 2020. This is on page four, you can read it. It says, educational policy lays particular emphasis on the development of the creative potential of each individual. It is based on the principle that education must develop not only cognitive abilities, both the foundational capacities of literacy and numeracy and higher order cognitive capacities, such as critical thinking and problem solving, but also the social, ethical, emotional capacities and disposition. So I want to focus on the so-called, the foundational capacities 
and the higher order cognitive capacities in particular, what do they mean by higher order cognitive capacities? I'll give you a few examples and uh, hope that you will reflect on them. Okay, <clears throat> one of the higher order uh, cognitive abilities, the ability to learn independently, learning from documented sources of knowledge from the internet or from books or articles without having to depend on teachers or educational institutions. So let me take an example. Suppose after you graduate, you are about 30, 35 years old and you are posted in Indonesia. And just before going to Indonesia, you want to learn something about Indonesian history. What would you do? Would you go to a, a school or college and take a course in Indonesian history? If you are educated, you don't need to do that. You can read up on Indonesian history and learn on your own. You don't have to depend upon a teacher. There are things that you can learn completely on your own. So, for example, you want to learn something about uh, human behavioral psychology. There are YouTube videos available, excellent lectures by some of the best professors in the world. You don't need to attend classes. You don't need to need even textbooks. Knowledge is available for you to acquire all over the place, especially now with the Internet. You don't have to depend upon teachers. I'm not saying teachers are not necessary, but you should have the capacity to learn without the help of teachers when teachers are not available. This is an important ability. I don't think our students have that ability. Our, our undergraduate students, the, my experience has been, are not capable of independent learning. That's a serious flaw in their education. Another important higher order cognitive ability that NAP 2020 points to is independent inquiry. That is a, uh, ability to construct your own knowledge. This is what uh, was called a, uh, constructivism in NCRT 2005, but I would rephrase, rephrase it as constructing knowledge on the basis of available information, including data that we gathered and our own thinking. The our own thinking is important part. It is not enough to take the knowledge that is existing already in a source, but also you must create your own knowledge and you must critically evaluate the knowledge that you have created. This is an important aspect of uh, higher order cognition. Are we doing that? I don't think so, but we must. Uh, the third item in the higher order cognitive abilities is, is critical thinking. Uh, and that means evaluating the credibility of our own and other people's beliefs, uh, evaluating the usefulness, effectiveness and efficiency of products, processes and practices, evaluating the ethicality of actions and practices, our own actions and practices, as well as other people's actions and practices, evaluating the beauty of works of art. That is a kind of spread of uh, critical thinking. Uh, I'm, I'm aware that these are all words at this point, but hopefully these words will uh, trigger uh, your search, internet search to find out what these words mean. And that's when you begin to get a sense of what critical thinking is. Um, and as a part of critical thinking is critical reading. When you read something, even if it's a textbook, you must think critically about what the textbook is saying. This also applies to newspaper articles, especially these days when you have all kinds of uh, false news, fake news coming, you must be able to read and evaluate and reject if it is not reliable. Uh, so this would mean newspaper articles and books meant for educated lay people and so on, whole range of things. Um, so what, uh, what the examples point to Uh, are the need to help learners to read critically. Our, our examples, what I'm talking about is the example earlier, the fungus example, illustrate the need to help learners to read critically, including textbooks, because textbooks can also give you false statements. Okay, so I just, uh, I just gave a very brief tour of uh, higher order cognition. Again, I would ask you to take a look at the article that I've mentioned here to get some other details. Or you can go to our website of Think. I've given you the address of that uh, website. Okay, 
Now that you have, uh, I have covered some of the, the concepts, let's take some examples. I'm not sure I'll be able to cover all the examples because I don't have very much time. I'll cover as much as I can. So let's take uh, the example that I already mentioned, the so-called angle sum theorem, which says that the sum of angles in a triangle is 180 degrees. Okay, let's try this. Uh, <clears throat> there is this idea of a straight angle in that you have learned in your textbooks. I think uh, probably again in eighth grade. That says, if AB is a straight line segment and D is on AB, then ADB is a straight angle. All right, this should be, if AB is a straight line and point D is on that straight line, then ADB is a straight angle. Straight angle means 180 degrees. That's exactly what it is. That angle at D is 180 degrees. And a straight angle is 180 degrees. OK? This is what you learn in textbooks, one, one part of the textbook. But you also learn that a triangle is made of three straight line segments. So ACB is a triangle with three straight line segments. And you also learn that the sum of angles of a triangle is 180 degrees. So I've indicated the three angles, A, C, and B. All right. Now, now let's ask, how many points are there in a straight line? So take, for example, line AB. How many points can you are there in that uh, straight line? Infinitely many. All right. So any point on a straight line of a triangle has infinitely many points and therefore infinitely many straight angles. This is a bit disconcerting, I know. So what, what do we conclude? If AB is a straight line segment with point D on AB, angle ADB is a straight angle. This is the proof. There are infinitely many points on AB and hence infinitely many straight angles on AB. Just one side of the triangle carries infinitely many straight angles, therefore infinitely many 180 degrees. Okay, so what that means is that it could not be the case that the sum of angles in a triangle is 180 degrees. We have concluded that it is infinitely many straight angles, infinitely many 180 degrees. But at the same time, you are also told that the sum of angles in a triangle is 180 degrees. So there is a logical contradiction which we are supposed to reject. The contradiction is one part of the textbook says sum of angles in a triangle is 180 degrees. But the conclusion that we have arrived at from the discussion of straight angles is that the sum of angles in a triangle is not 180 degrees. Which one would you reject? All right. Uh, whenever I bring up this example, there is a lot of anguish that people experience. I leave you with that anguish. I, I can solve that problem, but I'm not going to, because it is a good experience to go through that anguish and try to figure it out on your own. Uh, okay, so <clears throat> what did we do just now in this angle sum theorem? We deduced the logical consequences of statements. We detected a logical contradiction between the uh, statement that is derived and the statement that is given in the textbook. And we also pointed out, you cannot accept both. We must reject one of these statements. And what that means is the willingness to doubt and question textbooks to recognize that what textbooks say can be wrong. Right. Um, OK, maybe I should not be uh, too cruel. I'll give you a hint about how to solve this problem. And the hint is the word vertex. I won't say anything more. Uh, sure, because sure. Giving away the solution is not a good idea. So let me go to the next case, example four, classical mechanics. All right. Um, I, uh, this is something that everybody knows from school. Newton tells us F is equal to MA. That is force is mass multiplied by acceleration. Okay. Now, I want you to imagine two balls on the floor. 
ball A is stationary. This is ball A. And ball B, is, ball B is moving with constant velocity and collides with ball A. Now, given that ball B, this one, is moving with constant velocity, its acceleration is zero. So what is M multiplied by acceleration? That is zero. What is force? Force is also zero. So what that means is that B, when hitting against A, exerts no force. And if it exerts no force, then A should not move. Given that four and the law says that the body remains at rest or on uniform velocity, in uniform velocity, unless impel, impelled by an external force, we conclude that, uh, sorry, B, B will remain stationary. I'll, sorry, A. This is A, which is stationary. B comes and hits it. It is uniform velocity. So A will not move no matter what B does, if it is in uniform velocity. Obviously, this conclusion is false. So was Newton wrong? Or is it that there is something that you didn't quite understand? OK, I deliberately phrased it in such a way that you will be misled. But then if, if you cannot find a solution to this, obviously, you have not understood something very simple in Newtonian theory. I just wanted you to experience that anguish. Uh, OK. Um, I will skip this one because I don't have very much time. Um, so let me go to summing up straight away. What did we do uh, with these examples? Well, the emphasis was on the so-called rational temper. This ought to be an important ingredient of higher order cognition. And higher order cognition is something that NAP 2020 recommends that we help our students to acquire. Uh, this includes accepting logical consequences prohibiting logical contradictions, having a sense of uncertainty and fallibility, a habit of doubting and questioning, and requiring adequate reasons for accepting conclusions, for accepting there's a typo there. And these ingredients are central to critical reading, critical thinking, inquiry, research, and independent learning, all of them. Okay? And this is what we, have, we must focus on. And the final statement is, if we wish to implement NAP 2020's recommendations on higher order cognition, it is crucial that we build these elements of rational temper into the school curricula, which means we must build these things into our classroom teaching as well. And how can you do that? Well, that's a separate, uh, that's a difficult question. Uh, I cannot go into that right now, but I would invite you to go to our website thing, which the address is given in this PowerPoint slide. Uh, and you can figure out, uh, at least uh, we'll, you can learn some of those tricks of uh, higher order cognition, rational uh, temper, and inquiry, critical thinking, and so on from that website. There are lots and lots of uh, videos and PDF files there. Right. So thank you for listening.